I once heard that curiosity about World War II is kind of like the gateway drug to the serious study of history. My family has always been quite historically aware, and World War II was a staple of our frequent discussions about history. While my dad used to tell me about the tanks, guns, and planes that were the weapons of the war, my mom had a different focus. My mom was a voracious reader, and she specializes in books and novels about really, really miserable topics. Communist regimes, the Spanish Inquisition, the Rwandan Genocide, and of course, Nazi Germany and the Holocaust. One of the most evil and depraved, large-scale, premeditated horrors the Earth has ever seen. Today, it is unambiguous. To any rational person, the Nazi party was little more than an evil cult led by the most disgusting and reprehensible characters. Watching movies and reading books about the war, I always wondered why the German people allowed the Nazis to take over, and why there never seemed to be any serious attempts to remove the Nazis from power or to resist the evil regime that the German people were forced to endure. Quite naively, I thought to myself that I would have done something. Yes, I would have resisted. But as ever, my mom gave me some perspective. She asked, what if speaking out meant that my siblings, my brother and my sister, would be arrested, imprisoned, tortured, or even executed on faulty or flimsy pretenses as collaborators? Even token resistance could put one's friends and families in the crosshairs of the Gestapo, the infamous German secret police. The reality was that any form of resistance was swiftly and brutally punished, no matter how seemingly minor an infraction it might have involved. With the full power of the totalitarian state at their disposal, the Nazi party could, and did, easily crush any dissent. What could any lone individual do against such unfettered state power? Under these circumstances, it makes complete sense why so many simply kept their heads down. The sad truth that my mama taught me was that I probably wouldn't have been a hero. I would have most likely avoided any suspicion and may have simply hoped for an end to the nightmare eventually. Heroism sounds so attractive to us, but not so much when the price of any sort of heroic act of resistance was usually a swift execution, often preceded by prolonged torture and interrogation. Today, I want to talk about Sophie Schall, one of the leading figures of the White Rose Movement, a non-violent group of students who protest against the Nazi regime and who paid the ultimate price for upholding a cause of human freedom. Sophie was not married to any particular political ideology, nor was she a libertarian by any means. But what she fought for was something all right-minded people should support the freedom to live one's life on their own terms, not to be brainwashed, forced, or bullied into submission, but to freely choose how to live in line with your conscience. A life without conscience is no life at all. Henry David Thoreau said it best in his essay, Civil Disobedience. Must the citizen ever for a moment, or in the least degree, resign his conscience to the legislator? Why is every man a conscience then? I think that we should be men first and subjects afterward. Sophie Schall was born on May 9th, 1921, in Forchtenberg, Germany, a mid-sized town dating all the way back to medieval times. Her father, Robert Schall, was a liberal politician and served as mayor. She was the fourth of six children, all of whom were raised to follow the teachings of the Lutheran Church, and were deeply religious. Starting her education at the age of seven, it became apparent that she was a naturally gifted child with a talent for learning new things rapidly. By 1930, the Schall family moved to Ludwigsburg, and after two years, they settled in the city of Ulm along the Danube, where her father worked as a state auditor and a tax consultant. Here in Ulm, Sophie and her siblings nurtured their love of nature and the outdoors thanks to the perfectly idyllic German landscape at their disposal. Sophie was so entranced by the beauty of nature that later in life she wrote to her father, The sight of mountains, quiet majesty and beauty makes the reasons people advance for their disastrous doings seem ludicrous and insane. In 1932, Sophie began attending secondary school and joined the Nazi-sponsored Bund Deutscher Mädel, the League of German Girls, despite her father's protests. Robert Schall was a very insightful man who, before most, could foresee the dangers of Adolf Hitler. He warned that Hitler, like the Pied Piper, would lead Germany to eventual ruin. But he did not force his beliefs upon Sophie or his other children, who all joined popular Nazi youth groups. Robert Schall believed in the importance of open dialogue and discussion, the Schall's dinners were often lively debates over religion, politics, art, literature. Nothing was off the table. Despite the rigorous surveillance of the Nazi state, Robert and his wife Magdalena carved out their own enclave of free and unhindered expression and debate. He encouraged all of his children to read widely and think deeply. Above all else, 
He wanted his children to aspire to live in uprightness and freedom of spirit. Letters penned by the children of the Skoll family present Robert and Magdalena as model parents of the highest moral standards, who created a warm and loving home for their children. The Skolls were, above all else, a deeply humane family. Alongside the majority of her classmates, Sophie joined the League of German Women, enthusiastically rising to the ranks. Sophie and her siblings had joined Nazi youth groups for a sense of belonging and camaraderie. Sophie's sister Igne described the immense sense of belonging that, in her words, carried us safely through the difficulties and loneliness of adolescence. But this enthusiasm quickly transformed into disillusionment for Sophie. Though a child, she was no fool. When she was 12, she loudly asked why her Jewish friend with Aryan features like blue eyes and blonde hair was not allowed to join any of the youth groups. It became very apparent to her that these youth groups were not really about a love of the outdoors and camaraderie. They were more about indoctrination and control. Conformism and militarization marked every aspect of German life now. When her brother Hans acted as a flag bearer at the Nuremberg rallies representing Ulm, where the flag his fellow members had sewn emblazoned with the symbol of a mythical beast, they were told to use a more acceptable Nazi flag. Individuality and expression were not to be the hallmark of the Nazi state, in which obedience and submission were expected of the citizenry, in line with strict Nazi ideology. In 1937, Hans was arrested for membership of a banned youth group that promoted a love of nature, music and literature. Very dangerous things that ought to be controlled according to the Nazis. Sophie began to realise that the mass conformism being forced on the German population with the egregious use of state power brought to bear on those like her brother, who strayed from the norm. Once a bright young student, Sophie almost didn't graduate secondary school. With every class now consisting of varying degrees of Nazi indoctrination and propaganda, she lost all interest in her so-called studies. On September 1st, 1939, Hitler invaded Poland, and quickly after, France and Britain declared war on Germany, beginning World War II. What was once a peaceful and enjoyable life for the Schkolls dramatically changed. Sophie's brothers were sent to the front lines. Graduating high school in 1940, Sophie planned to undertake an apprenticeship as a kindergarten teacher because of her love of children. After her apprenticeship, Sophie aspired to study philosophy and theology, which she had begun to read all the time. But to attend college, it was a requirement that prospective students had to work for the state. Her apprenticeship as a kindergarten teacher was not deemed worthy of state service, and so Sophie had no choice but to work for six months through 1941 as a nursery teacher. Though around children she deeply cared for, Sophie was unable to impart much wisdom due to the stifling conformity of the military-like regime, alongside a mind-numbing adherence to routines. As her siblings were arrested and then drafted and the war dragged on without end, Sophie began to seriously doubt the validity and legitimacy of the Nazi regime, which had robbed her of an authentic and autonomous life. After finally completing her national service by 1942, Sophie enrolled at the University of Munich, studying biology and philosophy, alongside her aforementioned older brother Hans, who studied medicine. Hans introduced Sophie to his eclectic group of friends, all of whom were passionate about art, literature, philosophy and theology. In 1942, while Sophie worked at a metallurgical plant as part of her war service during summer vacation, her father was arrested and imprisoned for referring to Hitler as the scourge of God to a fellow employee. For this remark, Robert was imprisoned for seven months. Such was the fragility of Nazi egos that they had zero tolerance for uttering even the mildest of criticism. Criticism or questions could be infectious and undermine the carefully crafted image created by Reich Minister of Propaganda, Joseph Goebbels. Distraught by her father's arrest, while at her campus, Sophie happened upon a short pamphlet that gripped her instantly. It expressed everything she believed that was wrong with the Nazi regime. She was particularly entranced by one section that reads as follows. Who among us has any conception of the dimensions of our shame that will befall us and our children, when one day the veil has fallen from our eyes and the most horrible crimes, crimes that infinitely outdistance every human measure, reach the light of day? The crimes the pamphlet was referring to was the Nazi practice of killing the mentally disabled Germans under the misguided abomination of perfecting their mythical master race. Between 1940 and 1945, over 200,000 disabled Germans were murdered on the altar of Hitler's illusory notions of a perfected Volk or people. Shortly after reading this pamphlet, Sophie visited Hans at his apartment, but he wasn't there. 
While waiting for him to return, Sophie flicked through some of his books, and another arresting passage caught her eye. Underlined, it read, If a state prevents the development of the capacities which reside in man, if it hinders the progress of the human spirit, then it is reprehensible and corrosive. Instantly, she recognized that this quote was also in the pamphlet she was holding. She concluded that Hans was somehow involved. When Hans returned, Sophie questioned him. Hans attempted to deflect her questions in an attempt to protect her from the danger of the Gestapo. He told her, These days is better not to know some things in case you endanger other people. But Sophie would not relent. By the end of the conversation, Hans had no secrets left, divulging everything to Sophie and allowing her to join his efforts in a movement known as the White Rose. Before Sophie joined the White Rose, it was a small band of students and intellectuals alongside Hans that had published four pamphlets. They clandestinely disputed these pamphlets, which they call for a moral awakening in Germany. Using quotes from Aristotle, Fichte, and the Bible, they attempted to inspire resistance to the Nazi state, which for the movement had become the very embodiment of evil. Sophie and her fellow White Rose agitators urged every convinced opponent of National Socialism to sabotage and armament plans and war industries, sabotage at all gatherings and rallies, public ceremonies and organizations of the National Socialist Party, obstruction of the smooth functioning of the war machine. They also cautioned not to act alone, but to try and convince all of your acquaintances and warn against the destruction of all moral and religious values. In short, they advocated for and urged everyone to passive resistance. Each pamphlet urged the German people to reflect on the sins happening directly in front of their eyes every day. One pamphlet ended prophetically, stating, We will not keep silent. We are your guilty conscience. The White Rose will not let you alone. One member of the White Rose commented that Hans and another student, Alexander Schmorel, were the minds of the White Rose. But Sophie was its beating heart. She was in charge of copying and distributing the pamphlets, as well as managing the group's finances. One of her particularly important and sensitive tasks was collecting paper and stamps, visiting multiple post offices to avoid suspicion from the authorities. Over the summer of 1942, the White Rose distributed three more pamphlets with an increasing moral fervor, calling for passive resistance to the Nazi state. While some pamphlets expressed socialist ideas, they also had many ideas that libertarians would have found appealing. In one pamphlet, the author ends by writing, Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, the protection of the individual citizen from the caprice of criminal, violent states. These are the bases of the new Europe. After the German defeat at the Battle of Stalingrad, Russian forces destroyed nearly the entire Sixth Army. A massive blow, not just militarily, but also to German morale. German people began to question if the war really could be won. Voices of dissent grew in both volume and frequency. Students rioted at the University of Munich after being publicly humiliated, being called leeches and war dodgers. Hans and Sophie saw this as the perfect time to strike. Hans painted Down with Hitler on 29 public buildings and wrote the word freedom on both sides of the University of Munich's entrance. The Gestapo was increasingly alert, with the university being kept under surveillance. Thanks to the skills of Sophie, thousands of pamphlets have been distributed across the country, giving the Gestapo the impression that the White Rose was a national movement and a viable threat to the Nazi state, when in reality, it was a small band of morally minded students. Professor and White Rose member Kurt Huber wrote the sixth pamphlet that called on students to fight against the party. Huber explained that Stalingrad was just one of many of Hitler's disastrous ideas, and many more were to come unless something changed. On February 18, 1943, Hans and Sophie carried a bulky suitcase filled with copies of their newest pamphlet. While students were busy in attending lectures, they snuck about, placing pamphlets outside classrooms, windowsills, and stairways. On the way out of the university, Sophie took the remaining 100 or so pamphlets and tossed them onto students as they left their lectures from above. Sophie ran away immediately after tossing her pamphlets, but a custodian and a staunch Nazi supporter, Jacob Schmidt, saw her in hands. The siblings tried to mingle with the crowd and make an escape, but the Gestapo closed the building and Schmidt pointed the pair out to the authorities, who arrested them immediately. Sophie successfully purged any evidence from her person before being arrested, but Hans was caught with a draft copy of a seventh pamphlet for the White Rose. Hans had tried to get rid of the copy by tearing it and eating it, but the Gestapo retrieved enough to match the handwriting to a man named Christopher Profs, a fellow member. When Gestapo searched Hans' apartment, they found even more drafts, solidifying his guilt. While Sophie's interrogator initially thought her to be innocent, 
Once she found out that Hans had confessed, Sophie did something few people would ever dream of doing. As an act of sacrifice, she incriminated herself and confessed to her involvement in the movement in an effort to protect her brother and her comrades. This effort, though noble, sadly failed. Maybe Sophie would have eventually been cornered and forced to confess. Maybe she could have walked free that day. Maybe she could have walked free or be caught at a later date. All of that didn't really matter to Sophie. Like many who have lived under totalitarian regimes, she knew that a life in which one is forced to live a lie daily is not really freedom. Sophie's courage reminds me of a line from the 18th century writer Joseph Addison's play, Cato A Tragedy, where the main character Cato says, A day and hour of virtuous liberty is worth a whole eternity in bondage. The final line of the pamphlet Hans and Sophie smuggled read, Our people stand ready to rebel against national socialist enslavement of Europe in a fervent breakthrough of freedom and honour. Sophie unambiguously was not waiting to rebel, but already fighting the state, leading the charge. Sophie Hans, another White Rose member, Christopher Probst, were detained and eventually hauled for the People's Court for Roland Freisler. The People's Court was established in 1933 and presided over cases of so-called political offences. These offences included crimes like black marketeering, treason and defeatism. All of these alleged crimes were deemed to be designed to weaken the Nazi state and attracted heavy sanctions, often including the death penalty or, if you were lucky, life imprisonment. Roland Freisler, who served as president of the People's Court, was known as the Hanging Judge, because 90% of the cases brought to him resulted in a death sentence or life imprisonment. Freisler's notoriety didn't end there, though. He also holds the distinct dishonour of introducing to German law the death penalty for juveniles. Sophie and Hans both knew they were going to die, but even the Gestapo was impressed with their calm and stoic bravery. This whole affair basically being a show trial, the siblings didn't get to select their own legal representation. Instead, they were assigned a state lawyer who was little more than a stooge, a hopeless puppet on a Nazi stage. Sophie said to their lawyer, If my brother is sentenced to die, you mustn't let them give me a lighter sentence, for I am exactly as guilty as he is. Hans, before leaving his cell to proceed to the court, wrote the words of the poet Goethe, and his father often repeated, Hold out in defiance of all despotism. The trial was a complete sham. Roland had already made his mind up before breakfast. It began and ended on February 22nd. Roland Freisler pontificated endlessly, condemning Sophie, Hans, and Christopher. And the young trio endured his beratings as he flapped about, flowing his robes. The defendants had no opportunity to speak on their own behalf. But in the middle of Roland's long-winded tirade, Sophie responded, Somebody had to make a start. What we said and what we wrote are what many people are thinking. They just don't dare say it out loud. Igne Skoll, the sister of Sophie and Hans, recounted that by the time her parents, who had rushed to Munich from their home in Ulm for the trial, managed to push their way through the courtroom, the proceedings were effectively over. They only arrived in time to hear the sentences announced. The trio were deemed guilty of treason, conspiracy, rendering the armed forces unfit to protect the Reich, giving aid to the enemy, and crippling and weakening the will of the German people. They were all to be executed by guillotine that very same day. As the verdict was passed, the loving father, Robert Schall, shouted in agony, There is a higher court before which we all must stand. While waiting to be executed at Stadelheim Prison, Sophie's cellmate, Elsa Gable, recorded her last prophetic words. It is such a splendid sunny day, and I have to go. But how many have to die in the battlefield in these days? How many young, promising lives? What does my death matter if by our acts thousands are warned and alerted? Among the student body, there will certainly be a revolt. Sophie Schall was beheaded sometime around 5 p.m. on February 22, 1943. She was just 21 years old when she was put to death by the Nazi state. The revolt Sophie wished for did not occur. It would take another two years until the Nazi war machine would finally be dismantled. Even worse, following execution at the University of Munich, a rally was held in honor of the custodian Jacob Schmidt who helped capture the Schalls. He was hailed as a hero by thunderous applause for being an informer, a snitch, responsible for the deaths of three promising, young, humane minds. The Nazi propaganda machine made it so no one could utter a single positive word about Sophia Hans. The Gestapo cracked down on the White Rose, and more execution followed till the group was all but wiped out. 
The last thing Sophie did as a free woman was toss the white rose pamphlets into a crowd of students. Quite poetically, the same pamphlet she had died for was smuggled out of Germany to the UK by a German jurist named Hans Graf von Molchte. The Allied forces used their planes to drop millions of copies across Germany with a new title, The Manifesto of the Students of Munich. Sophie Scholl and the White Rose did not bring an end to the Nazi state, this much is obvious. But does that mean that what they did was for nothing and they simply died in vain? Sophie Scholl did not stand up for some grand or utopian vision of the world. I think she stood for an elementary principle. Individuals have the right to choose how to live and to live in freedom. Under the leadership of Joseph Goebbels, the Nazi propaganda machine and brainwashing efforts seeped into every last crevice of life. People like Sophie and Hans do what they could to keep the inner lives of their fellow Germans clean from Nazi corruption. Adolf Hitler once said, Conscience is a Jewish invention. Like circumcision, it mutilates man. One must distrust mind and conscience. One must place one's trust in one's instincts. Hitler and the Nazis abhorred the idea of objective reason and preferred to rely on willpower. What Hitler describes is the lowering of humans to the level of savage beasts. Our ability to choose is what makes us human. Sophie, akin to figures like the defender of religious freedom Roger Williams, also fought for the principle of conscience. The right of every person to act in accordance with their sense of morality. Without this right, there is nothing left to fight for. Without a conscience, we are no longer human. A terrible lesson the heinous Nazis taught the world. At the beginning of this episode, I claimed that my mom loved stories about miserable times and horrific regimes. But as I got older, I came to realize this wasn't really the case. That in fact, she was attracted to the stories of bravery and beauty of the indomitable human spirit in the face of overwhelming circumstances. Today, many streets, squares and fountains throughout Germany have been named after Sophie and her brother Hans. Many brave people fought and died during World War II, but I believe Sophie to be among the most courageous of them all. She challenged the Nazi war machine unarmed, relying only on her moral sense. My personal favorite philosopher Cicero once wrote, Not to know what happened before you is to be a child forever. We study history in the hopes that we do not repeat the miseries and inhuman acts of the past. The proper study of history results in a skepticism of power. In this vein of thought, we ought to remember the sacrifice of Sophie Scholl. Thomas Mann, the acclaimed novelist and Nobel Prize winner, during his monthly anti-Nazi broadcast on the BBC, said of the White Rose, Good, splendid young people, you shall have not died in vain, you shall not be forgotten. Thanks, Emil, for listening. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. And if you did, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Portraits of Liberty is written and hosted by me, Paul Meany, and produced by Landry Ayers. You can also visit libertarianism.org to find more shows like this. I hope to see you next time.